Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming tonight. To everybody that's joining us online, I know a number of people will be watching this uh, later. Uh, we want to say a welcome to them as well to our summer concert. Um, expressions of faith and culture. And what we're really going to be looking at when I kind of uh, thought about this and talking with Brian was just different time periods in uh, American history, starting with the founding of Jamestown. So that's our first piece is contemporary with that, 1607. Then we're going to hear a, a song that was popular during the Revolutionary War, uh, a Negro spiritual that was uh, um, coming around the Civil War area, era. Uh, we know that this is one of the things that we struggle with in our nation. We have a nation that was founded on liberty, and yet we had a nation that also uh, embraced slavery in, in many of its states. And we, we live with kind of that shadow today. Um, so the Negro spiritual there, the African American spiritual, as it's called now, is really kind of uh, echoes that. Then we move into the post-Civil War area with some ragtime, and then last century with some jazz, a little rock, and then I'm gonna come back up for some remarks um, about one of our local liturgists from last century. Many of you, if you grew up in O'Fallon, you probably knew of him when he retired to the convent. Monsignor Hellregal will be talking about uh, his influence in the church and the local church of St. Louis and his instrumental role he played in liturgy and even in uh, the liturgical developments of Vatican II. So with that in mind, I think we're uh, ready to start this evening. Thank you all for coming, and, and I'll have some uh, little closing remarks, uh, say, for all of our musicians tonight. We appreciate their dedication and practice. Thank you, Padre. So as he mentioned, we're going to start uh, first uh, around the time of the founding of Jamestown. So the first piece that we have is called Ave Verum Corpus. So the conversion of England from the Roman Catholic Church to the Church of England by King Henry VIII and later Queen Elizabeth I forced those who wished to practice Catholicism to do so covertly as penalties included fines, scrutiny, torture, or death. All vestiges of the old religion were summarily prohibited, including the use of Latin, only English was permitted. In this highly volatile and oppressive atmosphere, Byrd played a dangerous game. Refusing to conform to the new religion, he composed music for use in Catholic services, held secretly in private residences, more often than not in Latin. He managed this rebellion without loss of life or livelihood, due in part to his exemplary musical skill and by frequently dedicating publications to the Queen. It is widely accepted that Byrd intended his Latin motets for use either in these underground masses or for publication in books for use in homes, much like madrigals. So this is Ave Verum Corpus by William Byrd.
Thanks to Betsy Brown singing soprano, Betsy Struckhoff singing alto, Mary Sweeten singing tenor, and Mike Brown singing bass. Give it up for him one more time. So you'll notice tonight that this concert is, uh, you know, very varied. It's a summertime concert. We're going to have some fun. So. Uh, that is probably uh, one of the last of the more solemn pieces that we do. So next we have uh, the Liberty Song. The Liberty Song was written in 1768 when John Dickinson set out to reflect on the political strife caused by the Townsend Acts of 1767, or the latest in a series of British Crown taxes levied on the colonies. Dixon wrote the famous words to fit the music of the anthem of the British Royal Navy, Heart of Oak composed in 1759 by Dr. William Boyce. Boyce's music was first performed in London in Hart Lequim's Invasion with the words that Dickinson freely adapted famed British actor David Garrick's lyrics, especially in the chorus and Dickinson's friend Arthur Lee in Boston en route to England for law studies also contributed two stanzas. When Dickinson wrote his lyrics, he undoubtedly knew well that the patriotic association with the Navy of the words and music of Heart of Oak. Perhaps because of this, he also used the song to comment on his colleague John Hancock's ship called Liberty, which had been seized by the authorities for smuggling. This seizure, along with anger over the acts, precipitated riots and led to the declaration of a suspension of English imports by Boston merchants in August 1768 to begin December 31st. So first published in the Boston Gazette in 1768, the Liberty Song later appeared in the Boston Chronicle of August 29, 1768. It was sung throughout the colonies at political meetings, dinners, and celebrations. It is likely that the Liberty Song was the first song to express American patriotism. So it's likely that this was the first song where we celebrated American patriotism. The most famous passage in the song is the source of a phrase known to many Americans centuries after, by uniting we stand, by divided we fall. So this is the Liberty Song, tune written by William Boyce and lyrics written by uh, David Garrett. Shall some 
So now we move on into uh, a little bit of a, a darker time in American history, uh, the time around the Civil War, uh, the reality of slavery and such. Uh, Betsy Struckhoff, our alto soloist tonight, is going to perform uh, the Negro spiritual, Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child, also called Motherless Child. It dates back to the era of slavery, and an early performance of the song was in the 1790s by the Fisk Jubilee Singers. It was commonly heard during the Civil Rights Movement in the United States, and it has many, many variations and has been recorded Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. So next we have The Entertainer, which is a 1902 classic piano rag written by Scott Joplin. It was first sold as sheet music and in the 1910s as piano rolls that would play on player pianos. I'm not so lucky enough to have a, a roll. I have to do it myself tonight. So, <laughs> The Entertainer is subtitled A Ragtime Two-Step, which was a form of dance popular until about 1911 and a style which was common among rags written at the time. The copyright on The Entertainer was registered December 29, 1902, along with two other Joplin rags, all three of which were published by John Stark and Son of St. Louis, Missouri. So this is The Entertainer.
Thank you. Thank you. So the next one, our lineup, uh, we move uh, from the 1910s, 1920s into the jazz era. Take five is a jazz standard composed by saxophonist Paul Desmond and originally recorded by the Dave Brubeck Quartet for their album Time Out at Columbia Records 30th Street Studios in New York City on July 1st, 1959. Two years later, it became a surprise hit and the biggest selling jazz single ever. Revived in numerous movie and television soundtracks, the piece still receives significant radio airplay. The single was inducted into the Grammys Hall of Fame in 1996. Take Five is known for its distinctive two-chord piano-based vamp, catchy cool jazz saxophone melodies, intensive jolting drum solo, and unorthodox quintuple time, or 5-4, from which David Brubeck derived its name Take Five. So I get to do all of that <laughs> by myself now. This is Take Five. Now we move into the modern era. So this pro song probably doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, but I'll just give you a little bit of background. So the next one is Piano Man. This is a song by Billy Joel, and I'm going to be playing an arrangement uh, that's by a contemporary jazz pianist, Johan Kim. So everything that I will play has been transcribed. This is somebody that's uh, done this as a solo piece and transcribed it. So uh, you may know Piano Man is a fictionalized retelling of Joel's own experience as a piano lounge singer for six months in 1972 to 1973 at the now defunct executive bar in the Wilshire district of Los Angeles. In a talk on Inside the Actors Studio, Joel said he got, Joel said that he had to get away from the New York 
due to a conflict with his recording company and hence lived in Los Angeles for three years with his first wife. Since he needed to work and pay the bills but could not use his better known name, he worked at the executive room bar as a piano player using the name Bill Martin. Joel has stated that all of the characters depicted in the song were based on real people. John at the bar was really the bartender who worked during Joel's shift at the bar. Paul is a real estate novelist, refers to a real estate agent named Paul who would sit at the bar each night working on what he believed would be the next great American novel. The waitress is practicing politics, refers to Joel's first wife, Elizabeth Weber, with whom he moved to Los Angeles from New York in 1972 and who worked at the executive room as a waitress while Joel played the piano. Billy Joel had moved from New York to LA to record his first album, Cold Spring Harbor, which was marred by a mastering error by the album's producers at Family Productions, the first label that signed Joel. After this bad experience, Joel wanted to leave his contract with Family Productions for Columbia Records, but the contract that he had signed made this very difficult. So Joel stated that he was hiding out at the bar, I'm sure we've all been there, performing under the name Bill Martin, while lawyers at Columbia Records tried to get him out of his first record deal. So that's a little bit of the background on Piano Man. So here is Piano Man, written by Billy Joel and arranged by Johann Kim.
So uh, before we have our final piece, I'd like to invite Father Tom back up because he has some uh, closing commentary for us all, um, especially as it relates to our last piece, to Jesus Christ, our sovereign king. I want to thank uh, all of you for coming tonight uh, as part of my closing remarks. And really, at any parish you go, a lot of them are blessed to have a, a good and sufficient uh, music and liturgy program. And we're very blessed here to have an exceptional uh, program. And we want to thank uh, Brian and Mary and Mike and Betsy and Betsy for all of your work, the choir, our, our other mem members of our music program here. You know, this is an overflow from that because really the it's mainly the liturgy that drives this parish. We are here to celebrate the sacraments of Jesus Christ, that Christ is with us. Something like tonight and, and the joy and beauty of tonight is really a overflowing from what we experience at the liturgy. If you know uh, Monsignor Hellriegel, Hellriegel or know of him, he was a pastor at Holy Cross in Baden in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and a uh, German parish, and was instrumental in liturgical reform last century before the Vatican II. And you've ever met anybody from Holy Cross, I'd always joke when I was newly ordained, you had to genuflect when you said the name, because they have a powerful devotion to Monsignor Hellriegel. If you, any of you remember Bishop Paul Zippel, he was a protege of, of Monsignor Hellriegel. And one of the things Monsignor Hellriegel wanted to do was take the life of the church celebrated at Mass and have it overflow into the life of the parish. So, for instance, no Halloween. <clears throat> he didn't celebrate that at all. That was pagan. However, everybody dressed up as their favorite saint, and he made All Saints Day every bit as big and engaging for the children in the school than Halloween. Not big on Santa Claus, very big on Saint Nick, celebrating Saint Nick's Cherry. So he always wanted to distinguish between, here's the Catholic culture he wanted to create and there's the, the culture out there. So today's hymn that we're going to finish with, which is a very popular one, almost a guarantee that we're going to sing it on Christ the King, right? That's almost a given, sort of like We Three Kings on Epiphany. He wrote in 1941, and he wrote it in response to uh, the Nazi uh, kind of rabid nationalism that was going on in Germany, where they were developing this cult of the Fuhrer, and he wanted to remind all the good Germans in his parish, there is no leader, there is our king, Jesus Christ. And so this king really is an exalt, the hymn is an exaltation of who Jesus Christ is as our king, who do we honor, where are we headed, how do we want to live our lives really as, as citizens under his kingship. So uh, tonight's hymn that we're going to finish with is 736. If you'd like to join along in singing um, with our musicians, you're welcome to do that. I believe it's 736. And a couple other uh, little remarks. There is a, a little donation basket there if you want to donate to support music ministry. Certainly, it's all a free will offering. And I really want to give another round of applause for, for Brian and all of our musicians tonight, and Mike and Betsy and Betsy and Mary, for all the time they take and dedication for tonight's um, uh, performance, our concert. So thank you all. One, one other little remark I want to make. And I, I want to make this personally to Brian. So I just hand him these things. And I say, here, how about this idea? And, and throw it at him. And all the research he did on the songs, the history background, that's all his homework. And he did an exceptional job with that. Because if, if I would have done that, it would have been, yeah, um, written in uh, 1872, and I hope you like it. And, and you sit down. And that would be it. So he did his homework for the research. And all that adds, hopefully, to our appreciation of the gift of music, the circumstances, that beautiful opening piece we had tonight. So I know that's part of Catholic heritage and trying to celebrate a church that was oppressed and underground and, and then different manifestations of American culture. So thank you, Brian, for all your work in doing that. And thank you all for coming tonight. 736, to Jesus Christ, our sovereign king.
So this does conclude our concert for tonight. Thank you all so much for coming. Have a good night.